welcome you here. If you're new here, we want to welcome you. We're, we're a church that studies book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We go through the whole Bible. So we started in Genesis. Now we're all the way into Ezekiel. We're in chapter 23. We got that from our pastor, Chuck Smith, actually, who uh, kind of set that down. Let's study through the whole Bible, you know, and uh, that's what we do. But the prayer room's open every other Wednesday night, a group of folks in there that they're called and they have a passion for prayer, and I'm so, I'm so thankful for them, because I need prayer all the time. <laughs> but if you need prayer tonight, don't hesitate to head over there and let them pray for you. Don't, don't carry, don't, don't try to go it alone, you know, whatever you're going through. Uh, that's what the body of Christ is for, and so... We are in Ezekiel 23. On Wednesday nights, we're studying through what we call the Old Testament, okay? And it's basically the history of a people that God has raised up, the people, you've heard of these people, the Jewish people, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel. And God has raised them up because through them, here's the plan from the beginning. He started with one man, Abraham. And he said to Abraham, through you, Abraham, I'm going to bring blessing to every family on the face of the earth. That's why God raised them up. Through you, I'm going to bring my light and my salvation to the world. And he said, I'm going to give you your own land. I'm going to give you offspring. He told this guy, Abraham, he was from southern Iraq modern-day southern Iraq, Babylon, the Babylonian area, Ur, the Ur of the Chaldees. He was from an idol-worshipping family, Abraham. Ever heard of Abraham? Most of the world has heard of Abraham. But God said to this guy when he was one man, he said, I'm going to make your name great. And he give you offspring, give you this land, and through you, all families of the earth will be blessed. And it's through these people, the whole Old Testament, it's a record of the failure of these people. <laughs> and, it, at, and simultaneously, it's a record of the faithfulness of God to preserve them, to continue with them, and to bring through them what he promised for the world which is his word, all the prophets, all the apostles of the Christian faith, they're all, from, they're all sons of Abraham, and especially the Messiah of Israel. His name is Jesus, okay? The very first words of the New Testament, okay? We're looking at the Old Testament on Wednesday. The very first words, Matthew, Matthew's the first book, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So Jesus is the one that the whole Old Testament is pointing to. The people of the Old Testament, just like me, just like you, we fail. We're weak. It's not about us. God, it's about God who is faithful. And it's all leading toward Jesus, who would come and justify us. He would come and save us <laughs> from our weakness. He would come and forgive us of all our failures. So that's the big picture. But we're at a moment in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel's a prophet who's speaking to his own people. He's one of these people. He's a Jewish man from the southern kingdom of Judah. And the people of God had so chronically been turning their back on God to idols that God had been warning through Ezekiel, he's going he's gonna to spank you really hard <laughs> is the essence of the message. He's going he's gonna to cleanse the land of all these idols because this is his land. You know, they'd even put idols inside the temple of God. And so the warning of the prophets was God's going to spank you. He's going to take you out. He's going to remove you into Babylon for 70 years and clean out his land. 
It's kind of like when we tent our houses to exterminate termites, right? You get everything that's living out of the house. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's actually God's mercy that he's going he's, he's, he's gonna to remove them and then he's going to clean the land. He's going to use the Babylonians. The Babylonians are the instrument, the paddle, if you would. Do you ever get a spanking when you were a kid? My, my mom used a belt. She never hurt me. It was always right there on the little, that little fleshy spot in the butt. But Babylon is some people use paddles, you know, a wooden spoon or whatever to do the little spanking with. Babylon is the wooden spoon that God's going to spank his people. But he's not going to forsake them, just like when he spanks you. He's never going to throw you out. God never forsakes his people. He disciplines us, but he never forsakes us. And he always finishes what he started in us. No matter what, no matter how long you make your life miserable. <laughs> you know, God's like going, have at it. I'll see you in 10 years. You want to waste 10 years? You want to be miserable for 10 more years, 15 years? I'll, I'll be there when you're done. And then I'm going to finish what I started. He that began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. And so here's Ezekiel right before. This is right before the Babylonians come in and destroy Jerusalem in, in complete a, a third and final deportation because of their chronic idolatry, they're, they're profaning the temple, they're polluting God's land. And God is going to straighten them out because through them, he's, his plan is to bring his light and salvation to the world. So God's zeal to discipline these people is his love for you and me because he's, he's, gonna, he's gonna bring through them light and salvation for us. That's the big picture of what we see. But the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel says, chapter 23, verse one. God always refers to Ezekiel when he addresses him as son of man. He says, listen up, Ezekiel. There were two women, the daughters of one mother, so two sisters, they committed harlotry, prostitution in Egypt. Okay, now Israel had, when they were very young, 70 people, they went into Egypt. And they were there 400 years and they multiplied to, many believe, a million and a half people over 400 years. But here he says, he's giving this, it's a story, it's an analogy. Okay, there's, these two, there's these two women, the daughters of one mother. They committed harlotry in Egypt. They were, they, when they were in Egypt, they were struggling with the idols of Egypt. In their youth, in their breasts were their embrace. Their virgin bosom was pressed. So two sisters, by the way, this is a disclaimer here. <laughs> I don't even know how to say this, but this chapter, just a warning, this chapter has the most vulgar verse in the whole Bible that's in this chapter. When we get to it, I'm going to read the verse. I'm not going to open it up. I, I, and I'm like, I'm the loose canon of preachers, you know. I'm, I'm more loose than any pastor I know, and I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> But you'll, you can go home and look at it. But we'll, we'll get to that verse later. But it's even, even now, it's already started here. But God is, he's letting his people know that they're turning their back on him to idols. He's likening it to a wife that turns away from her husband and commits adultery, but even worse, becomes a prostitute. Okay, this is what... God's, God's expressing in this shocking way what they're doing to him. It's pretty, pretty intense. But these two sisters symbolically representing the northern kingdom, okay, by the, after, after, after all the kings, after David, after, actually after the first king was Saul, then David, then Solomon, after Solomon, the third king, 
of Israel died, the kingdom divided. There was the northern kingdom, the 10 northern tribes called Israel, and the capital is Samaria. Follow this. And then there's the southern kingdom that consisted of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and it was called the southern kingdom of Judah, and Jerusalem is the capital. Okay? Samaria, the northern tribes have already been carried captive by the Assyrians a hundred years earlier. Ezekiel's focus is on Judah. It's on the southern kingdom of Judah with Jerusalem as the capital where the temple is. Okay, so these two sisters, symbolically, this is symbolism here. These two sisters, he's not talking about two actual sisters. He's, just, he, he's showing symbolism of what God's people had done. One of the sisters is the northern tribes. We'll see this. The other sister is the southern kingdom of Judah where Jerusalem is. They committed harlotry, both of them. Before they, there was a split, the, they, were, they were together in Egypt. The whole nation was together in Egypt. And they committed harlotry there. In other words, God's saying, even from the very beginning, even from the very beginning, when you were young as a nation, you were unfaithful. Remember, the Old Testament is the record of the weakness and the unfaithfulness of God's chosen people. Just like I am weak. <laughs> and I know God's called me and he's used me. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a work in progress. But it's not about me. It's not about me. The gospel's not about me. I don't, the part that I come in with the gospel, I'm the wretched sinner who needs the Savior. <laughs> you know? And when I share the gospel with someone, I don't preach down to anybody because I need the, sa I need the Jesus I, I preach to anybody. It, I'm humbled. I, we come alongside people because there is no them, them, them sinners. There's only us. And we all need the Lord. <laughs> okay? So the name of these two sisters... You see the names there? I'm going to call the first one Ola, because it's easy for me to pronounce, as in Ola, como estas? So the name of the sisters are Ola and the, the elder, and then Oliba. I'm going to call the second one Oliba, okay? Her sister, the younger sister, and, and he says, these two sisters, they, they were mine, God says. They bore sons and daughters. As for their names, Samaria is Ola. Okay, Samaria is the capital of the, the northern kingdom, Samaria. And Jerusalem is Oliba. Jerusalem is the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah. Okay, so the elder named Ola, her name means her the, 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 te the temple or the tabernacle is in her. Okay, that's where the, the tabernacle, the temple was in Jerusalem. Okay, the, the younger Oliba means my, actually, excuse me, the elder is Ola and her name means she has her own temple. Okay, which the 10 northern tribes went into idolatry and they're already in Assyrian captivity. She, has her, she does her own religious thing, okay? The younger name Oliba, her name, the, literally in the Hebrew, her name means my tabernacle, my temple is in her, okay? The temple is in Jerusalem, okay? So these sisters belong to God. They belong to God as his elect as his redeemed, as his by the marriage covenant. They were mothers, notice there, to many sons and daughters, to the, nation, to the whole nation of Israel. This, these two represent the 10 northern tribes and the two southern tribes, which is the 12 tribes, the whole people of the chosen people. Samaria is Ola, Jerusalem is Oliba. So Ezekiel lays it out clearly. Samaria is the elder. Why? Because the 10 northern tribes, um, 
they were the first ones to turn to idolatry and the first ones to be sent into exile into Assyria. So she's the older. But they've both now turned to these idols. They've turned from God. Ola, okay, Samaria, the northern kingdom, played the harlot even though she was mine, verse 5. She was unfaithful to me, God is saying, in the most extreme way. She became a, a prostitute. Wow. This is how God sees idolatry. This is how the creator of all things, okay, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and everything that's in them, the creator. He made men and women in his image to know him, to walk with him, to fellowship with him. He's the one who made us, and he, from his perspective, he's the only legitimate lover of our souls. We were made for him to know him, okay? And so whatever other source we turn to to try to get our life, to get our identity, our sense of worth from, in God's eyes, it's an illegitimate source. Just like a prostitute is an illegitimate source of sexual intimacy. When a man goes to a prostitute, he's going to an illegitimate source his, that, that area of his life is, 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 for his, is with his wife, you see? So this is why God is saying she became this harlot. As, 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 as they turned from God and they turned to these idols that were made with men's hands, God sees it as, ah, oh, you've turned from me and you've become a prostitute. And she, speaking here of the northern kingdom, Ola, she lusted for her lovers. The neighboring Assyrians, okay, this was, the, this was this glorious world empire at this time. Just like today, America is, the, is a world ruling empire. The Assyrians were this mighty world ruling empire. They were, she lusted for her lovers who were clothed in purple, captains, rulers, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding on horses. Thus she committed harlotry with them. All of them choice men with whom, for, with, whom with, with all for whom she lusted, with all her idols, okay? So she, he's using this picture of a woman turning and just lusting after these young, you know, military officers in these beautiful uniforms, the best, you know, central casting looking guys. And this wife is looking, just lusting after these guys. This is the picture that God's creating, saying this is what you've done with me. You've turned and you're, you're looking at Assyria and all the power and the wealth, and you're just lusting after everything they have. And including the idols of Assyria. Interesting, a picture here of a prostitute seeking a lover to care for her, to protect her. The language is extremely graphic here. Okay? Israel first became attracted to their gods. Little Israel, okay, the little, little, little Israel. <laughs> it's called to walk with God. And God is going to make himself known through this little people. <clears throat> Even today, Israel, the Jewish people, are at one quarter of 1% of the world's population. They've always been little, really little, in their land, their little tiny sliver of land there. You know, God uses the little things, the foolish things of the world, to confound the wise. Okay, that's the way God works, so that no flesh will glory in his presence. But here, God is saying, you, you, you started looking at the Assyrians, like some lustful woman looking at these young military officers in their uniforms, and you just were lusting after, that, after them. 
Wow. Turning from her husband to her lovers, embracing the idols of the Assyrians, God is going to allow, and he already did, a hundred years earlier, the older sister, he's going to allow the Assyrians to come and take them away into Assyria, in a, in, in, in a sense, giving her what she was wanting. You're lusting after them? I'll let them come in and have their way with you. This is what ended up happening, and she's going to realize this is not what I wanted. <laughs> this is not what I thought, th thought it was. Okay, this passage describing little Israel looking with awe and envy upon the mighty empire of the Assyrians, lusting after all that they had, including all their idols. They feared the Assyrians, though they feared, they looked at the wealth, the power, the influence, the fame, and they thought, Maybe if we worship their gods that they made with their own hands, then we can get in on all that wealth and power and influence and fame. You know that a lot of the world has looked over the last 50, 100 years has looked to America in the same way? They're watching all of our movies. They're looking at everything and, and, and they want what we have. You know, and it's sad sometimes what goes out from here. It goes all around the world, <laughs> you know? And, and from California. California shapes the United States, and the United States is being watched by the world. I lived in Hungary for 17 years. I got outside, and it's like, I was blown away. They're all looking, everyone's looking at my shoes, and they're looking at your clothes, and they, they, they know all about it, you know? They're asking you about the movies, and. It's a trip, you know. He says in verse 8, she has never given up her harlotry brought from Egypt. Ever since you were so young in Egypt and the idolatry that you struggled with, you've, you've had this struggle all along. For in her youth... They had lain with her, speaking of the idols, that she lusted after this, the, idol, the idols, and the I idols had their way in defiling her and pressed her virgin bosom, and they poured, the, they poured out their immorality upon her. Okay, Th this interesting picture, this, you know, this illustration, ever since Egypt, you're lusting after these idols and they've had their way with you and defiled you. Therefore, I have delivered her into the hands of her lovers, God says, into the hand of the Assyrians for whom she lusted. I gave you what you just were so fixated on. You know, someone said the source of sinful pleasure becomes at one point the source of our punishment. So true. Here we see Samaria's lovers became her destroyers. Samaria, the, the, the northern kingdom, her lovers became her destroyers. They uncovered her nakedness. They took away her sons and daughters. They slew her with the sword and be, she became a byword among women for they executed judgments on her. Here's a little piece of history. David Guzik records, he's a historian as well as a pastor, but he says, when the Assyrians conquered Israel in 722 BC, they did this very thing spoken of here. Assyria humiliated Samaria and, is, and took her sons and daughters captive and killed many with the sword. This was well known to Ezekiel's listeners here in this book because he's speaking now to the, to, to the southern kingdom. He's speaking to those in, in Jerusalem who they, they understood that a hundred years earlier, the older sister was taken captive as she lusted after the idols of the Assyrians. And so Ezekiel, his listeners, were well aware of this. Now, although her sister 
Oholibah, the southern kingdom, saw all this. She witnessed it a hundred years ago. She witnessed her older sister being carried off. Even though she saw it, she became even more corrupt in her lust than her older sister and in her harlotry more corrupt than her sister's harlotry. Okay, Jerusalem had the example of Samaria and yet they didn't learn the lesson. They didn't learn. And they actually became even more corrupted than Samaria had become. And they're more accountable because they have the temple of God. They have the worship in Jerusalem there. Okay? And she lusted, speaking now this of, of the younger sister, she lusted for the neighboring Assyrians, the captains, the rulers, clothed most gorgeously, the uniforms, horsemen riding on horses, all of them desirable young men. Even as the northern kingdom of Israel had lusted after Assyria's power and wealth and fame and influence. This is, the, this is, this is what he's getting at. So did the southern kingdom of Judah. The picture here is that Jerusalem lusted for the material and the fleshly representations of that fearsome empire. And then I saw, God says, I saw that she was defiled The younger sister was defiled as well. Both took the same, they both went along the same way. We all struggle with it, don't we? (laughs) False sources of life, you know, idols. But she increased her harlotry, notice, her infidelity to God. She looked at men, notice, portrayed on the wall. Images of Chaldeans, Babylonians, Chaldea is Babylonia, portrayed in vermilion, okay? God's saying that the the inhabitants of Jerusalem would look at these images, these these drawings, these paintings, and archaeologists have dug these things up. They're in the British Museum and different museums around the world. These portrayals of these military captains on horseback, you know, of the Babylonia empire. So she's looking at these pictures portrayed on the wall and she's being seduced by them, you know. Even as previously it happened to her older sister, it's interesting. She was seduced by images portrayed on the wall this was the media of their time. You know, you take it, we talk about how media has really exploded in our day, you know, from television, black and white, to color TVs, you know, then, this, then the internet comes along, and cell phones, and, you know, and there's all sorts of seductive things to distract us. Here, here God says that you were looking at these pictures of these beautiful military officers, and you began to lust. You began to become distracted. We want, we want what they have, you know. Even if it means turning from our God to worship their, their gods. She looked at the men portrayed on the wall, these images, and she, so she, these men girded with belts around their waist, flowing turbans on their heads, all of them looking like captains in the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea, the land of their nativity. Now, what does that mean? The land of their nativity. The land of the nativity of the people of Israel. What is this? This is referring back to Genesis 11 that tells us that Abraham, the very first of these people, was from Chaldea, the Ur of the Chaldeans. He was from the Babylonian era, and God called him out of his idolatry, out of his culture of idol worship and called him to know the true and living God. And here, thousands of years later, God's saying, you've returned to the same idols. You're lusting after the Babylonians and their gods. You see what he's saying here? As soon as her eyes saw them, these images of these military, beautiful young men, 
you know? And they're uniform, handsome guys representing the power and the wealth and the influence of Babylon. As soon as she saw them, she lusted for them and she sent messengers to them. Okay? When a, woman, when a woman sends a message like, I'm open for business, you'll get some attention. <laughs> Women hold the keys, man. You know, if, you've, if, you get, if the door's shut, most men will, will get the message. Some guys don't. And those guys need to be knocked upside the head or thrown in jail. <laughs> but she's sending messages now. Hey, come on down. You know, she pursued, she actually, he's, God's saying, you pursued the lust of your eyes. These Babylonian officers were more than happy to oblige, notice, then the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love, and they defiled her with their immorality. And so she was defiled by them and alienated herself from them. You get the picture. They had their way with her. She reveled in her harlotry and uncovered her nakedness. And then God says, and then I alienated myself from her as I had alienated myself from her sister who had a hundred years earlier been carried away by the Assyrians as a husband or a wife. Listen, a husband or a wife whose partner has cheated on them naturally withdraws and emotionally shuts down. By the way, if you've cheated on your spouse and they've shut down on you, don't be surprised. You know, don't belittle them. You shut them down. You know, it was, it, it, it's not her fault, it's your fault. <laughs> okay, God says, you, I alienated myself from her. When you looked and lusted and invited and these men came and had their way with you, Yet she multiplied, notice her response. The, her cheating had alienated her from God, but her responses was to cheat all the more. Yet she multiplied her harlotry and calling to remembrance the days of her youth. She just thought about her wild party days back in Egypt when she was young and beautiful and was flirting with the idols of Egypt. When she played the harlot there in the land of Egypt for she lusted for her paramours. <laughs> Ezekiel next uses a shockingly vulgar illustration here to describe Jerusalem's unfaithfulness and lust after false sources. It's too vulgar, I'm not gonna expound on this, but it says whose flesh is like the flesh of donkeys, whose issue is like the issue of horses. I'm not gonna open that up. The idea is that she lusted after the power and the potency of these gods of Egypt, of, the, of the, the impressive military might and power of these other nations. You know, looking not to God, she looked to the Assyrians to satisfy, protect, provide. This is the idea. And thus you called to remembrance the lewdness of your youth when the Egyptians Back in the day when the Egyptians pressed your bosom because of your youthful breasts, your promiscuity, he's saying. The promiscuity, like, this is how God sees their idolatry. Is it's promiscuous. It's adulterous. Because God is the one who, he's the one who gives us our life. He's the one who fulfills our deepest needs, you know that he wants us to know him and walk with him. And then he wants to fulfill all the other desires of our heart. Do you realize that? Every hunger you have in you from hunger for a double-double to sexual hunger, God has a plan to fulfill it. But he is the one who fills our deepest needs. He is God, we were made for God. A marriage, a marriage is two people the way a marriage works is two people that worship God and get their deepest needs met from God, then they bring it to each other, okay? Most, many marriages, they, people aren't seeking God and they're not 
seeking to be fulfilled by God and they're looking for their partner to meet their deepest needs, that's idolatry. It's cruel to expect from another sinful, limited human being what only God can deliver. It's cruelty. And then people get mad. You're not meeting my needs. And it ends up in all sorts of verbal abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, because you're you're an idol worshiper. (laughs) And this is what they do. Violence comes out and bloodshed and just treating each other horribly. I'm so, and then you go find someone else and then they don't meet your deepest needs. We were made for God. He's our legitimate source. Everything else that we try to find their deepest satisfaction in, it's prostitution. That's what God's saying here. I don't know if you were here Sunday. It was a message to the Pharisees. And I realized while I was preaching, I got a Pharisee that's in me. But I also realized that when Jesus is ministering to the prostitute, he's ministering to me because there's a prostitute in me. (laughs) We're complicated creatures. I'm at the same time a Pharisee and a prostitute. I'm so jacked up, man, I need Jesus really bad. You know what, I have him. I have the Savior who died for sinners like me, for messed up, broken people like me. Praise the Lord, you know. And so God here, he says, therefore, a holy ba, speaking to Jerusalem, thus says the Lord. Remember, a holy ba means my, temp- my temple, my tabernacle is in her. He's just describing Jerusalem. He's saying to her, remember, remember who you are. You're acting so contrary to who you really are. All of this, all this stuff you're doing is not who you really are. Who you really are is you're my bride. You're my bride. I don't know if you've ever fallen into some sin and you immediately ask yourself this question. I've done this so many times. I It's so familiar to me. But I I, I jump into this thing or I do this thing and I ask myself, why did I do that? Why did you do that? It's like you wanna almost like, why did you do that? As if that's not really me. It's not. The real me, now that I've been saved by God's grace, is I'm a child of God. And yet there's times I act contrary to who I really am. And that's why there's this misery. There's a misery in that. And so God is addressing here, Oliba, my tabernacle is in you. You're, you're my bride, but look at what you're doing. And, you're, and it's not satisfying you. And it's wrecking you. Behold, he says, I will stir up your lovers against you from whom you have alienated yourself, and I will bring them against you from every side. Jerusalem and Judah would find that those that they gave themselves to, prostituting themselves to, are not going to treat them like lovers at all. The Babylonians, all the Chaldeans, Pekud, Shoah, Koah, all the Assyrians with them, all of them desirable young men that you're lusting after, governors and rulers, captains of the men, men of renown, all of them riding on horses, all these ones that you've lusted after, they will come against you with chariots, wagons, war horses, with a horde of people, they shall array against you, buckler and shield and helmet all around. I will delegate judgment to them, and they shall judge you according to their judgments. And indeed, all of these mentioned here, indeed came upon Jerusalem. The officers and the leaders of many nations with their powerful weapons, everything listed here, Daniel Block, the Bible scholar, he said, those who had previously come to her to make love now come from all sides upon her to make war. God says, I, verse 25, I will set my jealousy against you and they shall deal furiously with you. Notice that. 
these armies assembled against Jerusalem would not treat her gently like a lover, but they will deal furiously. They shall remove your nose and your ears and your remnant shall fall by the sword. They shall take your sons and your daughters. Your remnant shall be devoured by fire and they shall strip you of your clothes and take away your beautiful jewelry. Wow, how they dealt with Jerusalem. This happened in history, okay? It's recorded here. Ezekiel's saying what's gonna happen right before it happens. He's a prophet. He's saying this is what's about to happen. And exactly what happened here is recorded also in secular sources. Archaeologists have dug up what are called the annals of Assyrian king. And I, don't, I can't even pronounce this guy's name. Asher Nasser Repal II. It's recorded on these reliefs. I would have shown some, some of these pictures. You can Google this. The annals of the Assyrian king. Okay, it's, it's, they're on display in the British Museum in London and it records exactly what Ezekiel said was going to happen. And when this king came in and conquered them, he recorded what they did and it matches exactly what Ezekiel said was coming. And God says, and by this, by this judgment, thus, by this, I will make you cease your lewdness and your harlotry brought from the land ever since Egypt, ever since you were just so young and beautiful, when you, when you were so just beginning, so that you will not lift your eyes to them, to these idols and, to, and lusting after, you know, the power and the influence and the fame of the nations. And nor will you remember Egypt anymore. And indeed... After this harsh, harsh chastening, I call it a chastening, because God's not giving up on them. <laughs> He's not giving up on them. He never lets them go. Okay, but after this harsh chastening or judgment, if you like that word, judgment, Israel finally let go of their idolatry. They finally let go that she had held on to since Egypt for thousands of years. After this exile in Babylon, when they were brought back under the hand of Ezra and Nehemiah to rebuild the walls and the temple, they, there was no more idolatry like there had been ever since Egypt. This fire that's going to come, that Ezekiel is saying is going to come by the Babylonians, is not a fire to destroy, but a fire to refine, which is the same fire that God allows in our lives as he burns out the impurities. Read 1 Peter chapter one. It talks about this refining process that we're in, the refining fire, okay? Wow. The judgments described here, like we saw in the last chapter about the refining fire last week. It's a purifying fire. God never forsook these people. He chastened them. He cleansed his land. He took them to Babylon for 70 years. He brought them back. And through them, ultimately, he brought Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the savior of the world. It's interesting because it's onto that stage, Jerusalem, and among those people, that their Messiah, Jesus, is going to come again. That's why Israel, the Jewish people, the Old Testament, the, all these prophecies are relevant even today because he came in his first coming and he's coming again. And it's going to be on that stage involving those people. That's why they've been regathered in the last hundred and some years, reestablished as a nation. It's a miracle. Nothing like this has ever happened in human history. A people totally scattered from their land for 2,000 years and then re brought re a nation reborn, you know. A language revived and prospering, one of the most prosperous nations in the world in such a short time. It's a miracle. And there's some demonic stuff going on over it. It's the most demonic. It's the center of, it's the epicenter of, of international terrorism, the demonic struggle over the land there. 
and especially the Temple Mount. Okay, it's a trip. For thus says the Lord, surely I will deliver you into the hands of those you hate. Notice this, that you hate. I thought she lusted after them and loved them. God says, okay, I'll give you to the one that you're going to come to hate. Watch. Into the hands of those from whom you've alienated yourself. They will deal hatefully with you and take away all that you have worked for and leave you naked and bare. Okay, this is like many who get caught up in lustful affairs, feeling that it's love. Oh, I, I'm, it's, it may be obsession. It may be lust out of control. But once the lust subsides, and I've seen this movie, I can't tell you how many times. Once the lust subsides, hate commonly emerges in a desire to destroy the other. You ever heard this? There was a movie, I never saw it, but I heard about it. The, uh, I'm serious, I never saw it. My parents saw it and they were describing it and they were like clinging to their wedding rings. Back, this was a long time ago. I think it was called Fatal Attraction, you know? I remember my parents coming home and just like going, whoa. And they're like, they kept pushing their wedding rings on really tight. Because it's a real thing. There's this lust and the, there's this intoxication and this, I, I mean, I got to be true to myself. I got to follow this feeling. And then it turns into this psycho hate. It turns into, you know, blackmail and destruction and hate, hating each other. This is what God's saying here. The nakedness of your harlotry will be uncovered, both your lewdness and your harlotry. Instead of love and glory that lust promises, Jerusalem and Judah would find shame and hate, nakedness and hate. Okay? It's better just to walk in the Lord's way, <laughs> you know, to obey the word, to look and say, God, what's your design? And to not live by feelings. Man, if I live by feelings... You know, if I lived by every thought that runs through my head, I would be the creator of so much chaos you wouldn't believe, okay? There's times I'm sitting there talking to some sweet old lady and a thought runs through my head, punch her in the face. And I'm like, I put, I, I put my hands in my pockets. I'm like, no, don't punch her in the face, don't. Where did that thought come from? Because I don't want to punch her in the face. What is this thought? Oh, I've got to be true to myself, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'd be in jail. I'd be like the biggest creep ever. What is that? You know, there's desires that run through my body. You know, if I follow those desires, there'll be chaos in my path everywhere I go. You know? We walk by faith in the word of God, not by sight or feelings. This is how a life works, and this is how a life is built you see, and here he says, I will do these things to you because you have gone as a harlot after these nations. The word Gentiles is the nations. He says, because you've become defiled by their idols. You see, the, their lovers, he's actually speaking about their idols that are defiling them, that are having the, their way with, with them. You've walked in the way of your sister, the northern kingdom, who's been in Assyrian captivity now for a hundred years. Therefore, I will put her cup in your hand. Thus says the Lord God, you will drink your sister's cup, deep in, the deep and wide cup, and you will be laughed to scorn and held in derision because that cup contains much. Okay, this is the cup of the judgment that came upon the northern kingdom. You're going to drink the same cup, he's saying. David Guzik says this here. He says, being a holiba, having the temple, instead of a hola, who rejected the temple, it made no difference if it didn't result in faithfulness to Yahweh, to God, to his covenant. If the people of Jerusalem thought that having the temple would save them from judgment. It would save them from God allowing the Babylonians to destroy the temple. 
They needed to learn a lesson from the older sister who's been taken captive. And there's religious people today that they feel like I got, you know, I, got a, I wear my little crucifix on and so nothing bad can happen to me. Now, if you make bad choices, your life will turn into chaos, whether you wear a cross around your neck or not, okay? You will be filled with drunkenness when you drink this cup that I'll put in your hand, and sorrow, the cup of horror and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. You will drink it and drain it and break its shards and tear at your own breasts. For I have spoken, says the Lord, drinking this cup will result in national confusion. You, the, the, you'll be drunk and confused. Okay, this is the picture here. She who had shamelessly craved to be fondled by her lovers will in misery be tearing at her own breasts in, a, in inexpressible grief. This is again a shocking graphic type of a picture that God's warning, you see? And the reality is this, sin is pleasurable for a, for a moment, it says in Hebrews 11.25. That's, that's why we're tempted by it, because there's a dopamine rush, there's an adrenaline rush, but it brings death, it brings chaos. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you've forgotten me and you've cast me behind your back, therefore you will bear the penalty of your lewdness and your harlotry. And next he goes on and he lists some specific sins. Son of man, tell them, declare to them, verse 36. Verse 37, for they've committed adultery. So they've committed this idolatry, but they've also actually been committing adultery. And blood is on your hands. They've committed adultery with their idols and even sacrificed their sons whom they bore me, passing them through the fire. Speaking of this demonic, one of the idols, the gods of these nations around was this god they called Molech, this huge metal statue that was heated up molten hot and they would sacrifice their babies to the god of success. Nobody in modern day times would do such a thing, would they? that they would sacrifice their baby because the, this baby's gonna get in their way to success, okay? We're no better. I'm no better than the Israelites. I'm chosen. God called me, saved me. <laughs> the record, my, my part is I struggle and his part is he's faithful, <laughs> you know? But we are, as a culture, modern people all over the world, in China and everywhere, Israel and Russia and America and Japan and everywhere in Europe. This is the same type of stuff. You know, some people look at this and go, oh, the Bible was written for these ancient kind of primitive people. Nobody today would, would sacrifice a baby on the, to the God of success, would they? Come on now. You've done this. Israel was doing this. Moreover, they've done this to me. They've defiled my sanctuary. They put these idols in, in the temple and they've profaned my Sabbaths for after they'd slain their children for these, these idols, on the same day then they would come to the sanctuary and worship like, there was, like nothing happened, nothing to see here. Indeed, thus they've done in the midst of my house. And then returning to the imagery of a har the harlotry, he speaks of God's, the, the people's unfaithfulness to him. Furthermore, you sent for men. You sent, for, you, you, you beckoned men, clients, to come from afar to whom a messenger was sent, and they came. And there you washed yourself when they were coming. The client was coming, and you painted your eyes. You put on the makeup. You adorned yourself with ornaments. You got your seductive gear on. You sat on a stately couch or bed with a table prepared before it on which you had sent my, you set my incense and my oil, the, the incense and the oil that was to be used in the worship in the temple. You used it in the worship of your idols is what he's saying here. Wow. The sound of a carefree multitude was with her. When you sent for these men, a big group of 
carefree, you know, you know this, I was one of these kids when I was 18, drunk, carefree, going to party. The carefree multitude came in. The Sabians were brought from the wilderness with men of common sort who put bracelets on their wrists and beautiful crowns on their head. What is he saying here? At first, you lusted after the handsome, young military officers. You had this high standard in your adultery. You went for these beautiful young men on horseback that were military leaders. He's saying that's when you were young and beautiful. You were selective in your clients, but now you've aged, and now you're settling for anyone, men of common sort, any loser off the streets. This is graphic stuff. (laughs) And I said concerning her who had grown old in her adulteries, Will they commit harlotry with her now? Now you're just like this old aged prostitute. Sin makes us old before our time. And yet they went into her. You are old and tired and worn out. And yet these, you signal a man, it's amazing. And men that are not being ruled by the spirit of God, I talk to my, you know, talk shit with my wife. It's like, you know, you pray for your kids and we're all, we're all capable of all this base stuff. Don't, you, you don't look for a good person. You look for a person who knows they're not good and that they need to yield to the spirit of God. That's the kind of person I am. That's the kind of person my wife is. We, we, we look at each other, I think it's once a year, we look at each other and just say, let's, you know that whole adultery thing? We're capable of it. Let's just skip that chapter. <laughs> we look at all these other families and all these think, people that they go through that chapter. We're like, let's just skip that one. Like we're, We don't look at each other like, oh, we could never do that. We could. I could do that. That's in me. Adultery is in my flesh. Paul said these are the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, outbursts of anger, heresies, all this crazy stuff. It's all in there and potential, you see? And it makes you, if, we, if you yield to these things, that, that Paul says in the same book, the Galatians, he says, therefore let us yield to the spirit so that we don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. There are no good people, guys. I don't want to depress you. There's a good God who will fill you with his spirit and keep you from the crazy stuff that you could fulfill and ruin your life. That's the truth. Sorry to tell you the truth, the whole truth. That's nothing but the truth right there. She be- you became like an old prostitute, he's saying, to his people. And yet these men still came into you. <laughs> As men go into a woman who plays the harlot. Thus they went in to Ahola and Oholiba, the lewd women, but the righteous men will judge them after the manner of adulteresses and after the manner of women who shed blood because they are adulteresses and blood is on their hands. Adultery and murder in that day, in that culture, faced the death penalty. Watch. For thus says the Lord God, bring up an assembly against them. Give them up to trouble and plunder. Speaking of the Babylonians that are about to come in. The assembly shall stone them with stones and execute them with their swords. These two sisters that speak of the whole people of Israel. Just like if a person committed murder or adultery in that day, in that culture, there was a death penalty. God saying, you as a people have committed adultery and murder sacrificing your babies and there's going to be people that die is what he's saying here the assembly will stone them with stones and execute them with swords they'll slay them their sons and daughters and burn their houses with fire and thus i will cause lewdness to cease you see what's happening here i'm going to put an end to this i'm not going to give up on my people i'm not going to my plan will not fail I'm going to cause all of this to cease. And you know, in our lives, many times it takes suffering to get, to, to get over it. In fact, Peter said, 
What did he say? I forgot what Peter said. I heard that some chair crash over here and it just went, boom, flew out of my mind. <laughs> he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he may not spend the rest of his days serving the will of his flesh, but serving the Lord God. That's what Peter said in the New Testament. Sometimes it takes, a, it takes years of suffering till we're like, I'm done with this. I don't want to have anything to do with this anymore. And that's what God's saying here. It's through what's coming, the pain that's coming, that, that, that this idolatry is going to cease. And you won't be prostituting yourself to other sources. And they shall repay you for your lewdness and pay you for your idolatrous sins. And at that time, you will know that I am the Lord. The severe chastening will have a cleansing effect. The particular sin of idolatry will never again be the same problem after the Babylonian exile. This is a historical fact. The ultimate purpose of this judgment is not to annihilate, but to refine. That's what God's doing in our lives. He's going to faithfully carry out his plan through these people for the world, and indeed Christ has come, and he's coming again. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Ezekiel 23. Wow, Lord. <laughs> wow. This message is interesting. This analogy. Lord, it's graphic. And I just want to confess, God, that I have committed adultery on you. I don't want to, Lord. I thank you for your chastening in my life, your refining fire. I thank you that you don't give up on me. Lord, forgive me for all the things I try to find life in and my identity in, my self-worth in. When you're just waiting to fill me with joy, your love, your peace. We praise you that in, as we grow in this, as, we, as you work this in us, Lord, that you, we're, right, we're in your hands, that you're refining us, and you're going to finish what you started. You're going to keep refining us until we bear the image of your son, until we're loving like he is loving. So we thank you for this chapter. We pray that the lessons of it will sink deep, that we'll trust in your sovereign hand even more. Pour your grace out on us, we pray. We ask it for your glory in Jesus' name and everyone who agreed said together, amen. amen. God bless you guys. There you go. Ezekiel 23. I'm glad that's over. We'll see you next week. God bless. <laughs>